Welcome, I'm Richard Mullen, your host, and this is the show, Your Healthy Home. Normally, we concentrate on what your building is like, your roof, your walls, your basement, whether you have mold, whether you have moisture. But we're looking at health and safety from a different perspective today. We're looking at the people in the house. So today's guest is, he's actually the president and chief instructor of <clears throat> Uh, Safety Academy USA, located right here in Beverly, Mass. And his name is Mike Polonzi. Mike. Richard. Thank you for coming in today, sir. Thank I, uh, you for the invite. Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to this, and we talked <clears throat> about it a couple of times, how uh, he's got some information. And if we uh, interrupt the sound by any reason, we're both chewing on cough drops because the... Um, <laughs> Pollen is awful outside, so we're, <laughs> we're trying not to cough and try to be good and things like that. So, okay, here we go. I'd like to know about your background. I mean, you've got a pretty interesting background. I don't know how far back you want to go, but... Uh. <laughs> I'll just keep it simple. So I've been doing <clears throat> firearms, pepper spray, defensive tactics for 26 years. Law enforcement and civilian training. Um, I'm also a Red Cross... First aid, CPR, AD instructor, uh, pediatric child adult, and I recently became an American Heart BLS instructor as well. Um, coming soon is going to be canine um, first aid CPR, so I'm very excited about that. So I've been involved in a lot of uh, different aspects of security, dispelling rumors, ruining TV shows for a lot of people. Um, you know, I always say I don't criticize or critique. A lot of people believe what they see on TV will work in real life, and it does not. You know, that's entertainment, and that's fine. You know, I never fault anyone for their personal preferences. But when they come to me and want um, safety, security <clears throat> in their home or in their workplace, then that's where I kind of strip away the, the fluff of Hollywood and, uh, and get into the now, Does your, the your background, does this require licenses <clears throat> or, and oh, certifications? I mean, uh, this, uh, can anybody do it? <clears throat> anyone can go to school. Um, for the civilian side, for the law enforcement side, I was fortunate enough to be sponsored back in the day, many years ago, by the Sheriff's Department, and okay. then also by, um, I'm not going to mention the name, a, a federal government, who I worked for full-time as a trainer. They sent me down to school as well. So okay. you can teach certain things, but you won't get into the law enforcement aspect of it. I hold dual certifications where I'll certify people guiding uh, federal buildings and one cert pepper spray, for example. Pepper spray mm -hmm. certification for those guys, we spray. Civilian certification, we do not spray, and it's a oh, shorter class. When you say spray, like you actually test them out and we, they, we, yeah, they we, go through the we process? Yeah, we expose them, yeah. We oh, okay. let them see what it feels like. Yeah, they're getting paid. They get insurance, right? <clears throat> yeah. So that's the... Um, well, you know, I, I guess the question comes up when you talk about that. We talked a little before the show went on. What about the um, the way, uh, and we're in Beverly High School, mm -hmm. and, you know, how schools are responding to, um, you know, people coming in with guns, and, 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 and how do you really fight against that? And, and can you keep a school safe? I mean, does that have the possibility, or we just get a wait, and it's a wait and see thing? Can we keep a school safe? Sure. We absolutely, we can keep any place safe if we choose to. Uh, I've had this conversation so many times over the years, and um, I will tell you what I tell a lot of people. We can secure a hole in the street, any building up to including the White House, and everything in between. I know everyone says a good guy with a gun stops a bad guy with a gun. I hate that philosophy. I don't subscribe to it. The amount of training it takes to pull a gun, point another human being, make a successful shot, and not hit an unintended target, such as our children at school. Mm, yeah. Can it be done? Sure. Is, are we going to take the money and time to do it? Absolutely not. We don't even give the police proper training, which is a whole other issue we can get in. Those men and women in law enforcement are behind the power curve every day, and they know it, and they still go out and do their job. So to secure a school, we can absolutely secure a school so that no one can get in here with a gun and the kids are safe. We well, just choose not to. And would, would that include, how do you feel about armed guards in schools? I mean, that, that's... If, you, that, ha if yeah. you have the money to properly train armed guards, mm -hmm. then you have the money to secure the building. I would go that route before I start putting guns in schools. 
So in, in other words, I, I guess when you say secure the building, how do you see a secure building? For example, this is, you can't get into the school without a... You can't get into the school, yeah, with, with a fog, but there are other things to do as far as people coming in, you know, one way in, one way out, screening students and teachers coming in. Does it take some time? Of course it does. It will slow the day down, but it'll mm -hmm. be a safe environment. Bulletproof glass in the schools. You know, the whole argument people made me is, I don't want my kids going to a school that looks like a prison. Absolutely, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. we, we just change things that would keep them safe in the classroom and outside the classroom. And as far as it, we've, um, I've even looked in the past, you know, they have barriers so you can't drive through them, steel pole, um, concrete poles. Mm -hmm. So we put those in and we put the Beverly Panther logo all over it. So it looks like a Beverly Panther logo, but you know what? You couldn't get through it if you wanted to. Okay. So you can dress up all these security features to make the school look like the school but it would be safe on the inside. Um, much better idea than putting people in schools with guns. Well, I, I don't see it as a, then, I mean, from your description, I can't see it as, as a, an expense that is unreachable. I mean, if you're talking bulletproof glass in some, just some way so people can't get into a building, I mean, we already do that right now. I guess they well, could we do, do it better, right? We do. And just from your entrance, I had to buzz myself in. Right. But then I'm in. So there should be a second entrance as well. well. Actually, here, for here, just so you know, you, that's why I said if you wanted to use the men's room, you have to go through a sec, be let into the second entrance. And uh, one of the good things they did here, one of our guests came to the front door, and we had it like an 11 o'clock show, and it took them almost 20 minutes to go from the front door to get security to check them out and have them come through the school. So, I mean, I, I think that was a, a good thing that you did. That is, that is a good thing. It, I didn't like it because it, we were 20 minutes late. But when you look over, the overview is something different. So when you talk about security of any place, you're yeah. talking about inconvenience. It takes more time. It's not just a free-for-all, just walk through the doors, and I get that. But where's the trade-off? Trade-off is once you're in, you're safe, better learning environment, better attitude mentally, no one's worried about anyone getting in because they know they're not getting in. Mm -hmm. As opposed to if there's an incident where someone starts shooting, especially in the hallways in the school, bullet ricochet is huge. A bullet will ricochet down the entire hallway and hit everything in its path. Yeah, and plus split off and come into pieces, right? It, it could fragment. Yeah, yeah, it could fragment. Yeah. You know, I'm, and people are always surprised when I say this, like, I am not for, you know, shooting guns in a school environment. I'm not. And mm -hmm. you know what? I know we read about this guy saved so-and-so in a shopping plaza. And down in Texas, some guy shot a guy in a church. And okay, you know what? Someone wins the Super Bowl every year, right? One quarterback wins the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. How many players never go to the Super Bowl? Oh, right. The statistics are really just they're skewed. Shooting yeah. is a sport. No different than football or golf. And we have to understand that and develop the skills to get to the Super Bowl. And guess what? Shooting in the school environment is being able to win the Super Bowl. Well, as you talk about that, would you recommend, do you recommend people getting um, a license to carry, like a pistol or a, uh, an automatic, a semi-automatic? What, what can they have? What, oh, what are so, the limits? Yeah, so my classes, you know, I've been running a class a week on getting your firearms license. And last night, a lot of people came with the thought that they wanted a gun for the home. Six mm -hmm. hours later, we dispelled that. <laughs> They're still going to get a gun for the range, enjoy themselves. To use a novice who's never had a gun, they're years away from being successful at shooting, at protecting themselves with that gun. So we offer other options. When you ask me what guns they can have, I know the word automatic comes up. No one has a machine gun. That's an automatic. A semi-automatic, you only get one bullet for every pull of the trigger. And then there's a revolver. You only get one, obviously, revolver. You only get one bullet for every pull of the trigger. Um, we have a 10-round magazine limit in Massachusetts, which I think is maybe in, in you know, good faith they were trying to do something good. But really, if someone's not going to do a bad thing with 10 rounds, someone's not going to do a bad thing with 15 rounds. Because criminals are going to get guns regardless. And criminals don't take my class. Okay, so it, that's an interesting thing because I know people have told me they like the fact that they can... I mean, the difference between 10 and 15 doesn't change what you can do with that with that gun. You can either hurt a lot of people or you can have a lot of fun shooting the targets. Right. I guess it's all a decision you make and 
and, and numbers aren't really important. And criminals would get, you know, as I teach, do not go out of state and get a high capacity magazine over 10 rounds and bring it back because you recharge with illegal possession of a high capacity feeding device, which you and I and my students, law abiding citizens, don't want to break the law. Mm -hmm. Criminals do not care about yeah, they don't the think illegal that possession of a high capacity mm -hmm. feeding device. Mm -hmm. You know, the time it takes, like the guys last night, they saw me last night, they're going to go apply. They're going to wait six, eight, ten weeks to get their license. Mm -hmm. They're going to go to the gun store, pick out a gun. At that point, the gun store is going to call the FBI, do a NICS check. It's a National Instant Criminal Background Check System. They're going to do a background check on those people, making sure nothing's changed from the time they applied to the time they're buying the gun. Everything's going to be fine at that point. They're going to give them the gun. Then they're going to go out and you know, go to the range and do some target shooting. A criminal is not going to take the class, wait eight weeks, go do the NICS check, finally get to the gun, walk out the, count, walk out the store, and go, finally I can go rob someone, I finally have a gun. <laughs> that's right. not a realistic thought process. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that's where we get our, our information mixed because we put the good with the bad and then try to figure out how it works. And, I mean, it, if people are, are set on committing a crime, they'll probably find a way to commit that crime. They will. Yeah. Um, you know, black market guns are the third largest black market in America right now, unfortunately. You know, um, of all the gun crimes committed in the United States of America, only 1% of those are committed by someone who owned the gun legally to start with. Is that that's a solid statistic? That's a solid statistic, yeah. It's right from the FBI crime stats. And wow. um, <clears throat> as I dug deeper into that, because that's what I do, 50% mm -hmm. of that 1% were crimes of passion. Someone was cheating on someone. Yeah, so they lost it and they just yeah. uh, shouldn't have so had a gun in the house. So 99% of all gun crimes in America are used by someone who didn't own the gun legally, didn't buy the gun legally, didn't obtain the gun legally. Didn't steal the gun from a law-abiding citizen because we keep our guns specifically locked in gun safes when not home. And criminals can get a gun on the street much easier and much less uh, effort than trying to break into someone's home, thinking we're going to shoot them, break into a gun safe, get a gun, leave, as opposed to going to the corner for a few hundred dollars and buying a gun. Is it required for a, um, a gun owner, a licensed uh, gun owner, to have a lockbox or a safe? Is that a requirement? <clears throat> So it's highly recommended when you buy a gun, it's going to come with a trigger lock or cable lock or a lock carrying case. Mm -hmm. So when the gun is not being used, it has to be locked uh, by an approved locking device. I always tell people the sport is an expense, just like any other sport. You play baseball, you play golf, you buy golf clubs, golf bags, etc. You buy a gun, you get a gun safe, you secure it so no one can leave with it, even a small one, and you put your gun in there mm -hmm. so that who is ever in the home that's not supposed to have access to gun cannot unless they came, you know, with tools and the intent to break in. But it's really going to keep other people in our home safe from getting access, like children. Well, children, I, I think that's where we hear the, I mean, and that's been in the news so often in the past several years, is young kids getting hold of guns and, and shooting one another. I mean, what was it, a, a three-year-old recently? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, Shots took the, took the uh, gun out of the mother's purse. And the mother was... No, I, I would say if you were teaching, it, is it a good idea to carry a, a gun in a purse? Believe it or not, they make purses with holsters built into them. Okay. So if you're out in the world and that's how you want to carry and you've gotten the training to carry, because that's a whole nother course, concealed carry course. Mm -hmm. But once you come home, especially if you have young children, you go from the door to the safe, take the gun out, put the gun in the safe, and go make your kid... You know, dinner or whatever. So then there's the two there's two licenses. One is to have a uh, for recreation, a sport, or for ownership, right? Not anymore. No. They've changed that to where if you're 18, 19, 20, you would get a FID card Class C, which only lets you have a non-large capacity rifle or shotgun, which holds five rounds. Okay. Then if you're 21, it's just a license to carry, which gives you the ability to buy a rifle or shotgun that holds more than five rounds and a handgun. So there was, back in the day, target and hunting to buy a handgun only to be transported to and from the range right. and then yeah. license carry, but they changed that to where there's just two lights now, which makes sense because if you can give someone a handgun, if they're not going to do something between here and the range. Why not let them carry because they're not going to do anything anywhere else as long as they do it properly. Yeah. So I think so. We, we come down to the fact that emotion is the big thing, and how do you teach people to handle themselves emotionally? I mean, that's the big problem. 
Well, we go through mentally, physically, and legally prepared to carry a gun in the, in the basic course. Because mm -hmm. you know, I teach them, listen, pointing a gun at another human being is a horrible thing. Soldiers, police, me, you, my students, if we ever pull the trigger and kill someone, we're going to have emotional issues. Survivor's remorse, withdrawal from your family and friends. Don't think for one minute we are not going to start abusing drugs and alcohol because it's going to get to a point where we just want to get a good night's sleep and nothing's helping. And that's where the slope, you know, the slippery slope is people go from CVS and the liquor store because their primary care doctor and stress counselors have left, you know, it's, it's over. <coughs> and, and I'm talking about three, four, five years. Yeah. To I just need a break. I'm going to get a good night's sleep until that doesn't work. And then they bought them out again. So they bought them out, they find something that stops working, they bought them out again. They're not going back here, where are they going? Somewhere we, none of us should be buying something we shouldn't have, doing bad things to our body and possibly ODing you know, behind mm -hmm. a building or in our own home just because we want that good night's sleep because of all the stress of the core costs, which in Massachusetts, you shoot someone, the average court cost is $400,000. 400000 In legal fees. Could, could you, like legal fees, so going to court, is to that considering fines? No, no, just hiring a lawyer to justify the shoot. So in order to justify a shoot, there's a few things that you need to go through or to justify. The person we shot had the ability, means, and intent of causing us serious blood injury and or death. Mm -hmm. We had no reasonable means of retreat or escape outside our home, because I'm not talking inside the home right now. No lesser force was needed or warranted, and that was the minimum amount of force needed to stop the threat. So you need to prove all that while we're being charged with shooting someone and killing someone. And even if the criminal charges are taken care of in the beginning, the family will always sue you civilly. So wow. it is a long, involved process that no one needs, and I try to prepare them on how to avoid ever using a gun. Yeah, that, that's a, a, a real thought. I, I would think that, I mean, to me, that's really a, when I'm thinking of the 400,000, and I, I bet you that very few people, as they go to get their gun license, even consider that the possibility. But I, I wonder, what's your thought on uh, desensitiz desensitization of... Um, People who use uh, video games, and it's all about shooting and firing and killing, and I mean, it's sometimes hours, and it's a conditioning. It is. So, so now we got to go, what age are we talking about? Would, do I want an eight-year-old, and I won't mention the game? Well, I'm talking about some of the, the kids from 15 up to, I mean, I know people who are in their 30s and 40s who are game freaks. You know, they spend a lot of time. But a 30, 40-year-old knows the difference between right and wrong. Hopefully, right? <laughs> Hopefully. You know, they, they've gotten to the point where they know this is a video game, this isn't real. Yeah. There's no reset button in life. Do I want to see an 8, 10, 12-year-old doing horrible things to people on those video games? I wouldn't let my son do it. Now, do I think they should be banned? No, because everyone's kid has a different maturity level. Mm -hmm. I would always say leave it up to the parents. But just to blankly say everyone should have access to this and you know, no guidance is not a good idea. But I've never read any correlation between violent video games and violent actions in the world. I know people try to make the, the uh, bridge that yeah. gap. It's kind of my th that's what I would think, but I've never done any research on it either, so I can't give a, a you know, reasonable... Uh... And I've never read any, of, of, because of the psychological effects that I study, yeah. and I actually know a couple of psychiatrists who I talk to. Um, we never got into that deep. I get more into the what happens to my students if they actually shoot someone. Yeah. What happens when you actually shoot someone in your home, like your family member, which happens way too much. Yeah, there's a lot of stories about that. that, yes. that that's got to be horrible. The, the family is destroyed, I would It's think. destroyed. Yeah. Right? Just hot, you can't recover from that. Yeah. And it, the last one was the last December. For whatever reason, a guy in Chicago fired a gun in his... Um, Garage, and unfortunately, killed his daughter. Yeah, I mean, just. But you I mean, I have, you can't recover from that. And I have stacks of those over the years. Yeah. Um, 911 operator in Florida, 
She took a shot in her house in the middle of the night, ended up shooting her daughter. I mean, it, the list goes on. Yeah. So room entry and building clearing, all that, that's great for TV, but it's not something any of us should do ever. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, keep TV on TV. Well, I, I think we could talk about guns forever, but you know what I like to do? I'd like to go into the next step. We're going to talk a little bit about um, you also teach and license for pepper spray. Is that right? I do. I'm a huge advocate of pepper spray. Okay. For many reasons. All right. First, let's dispel the mace. It's not mace. Mm -hmm. Mace was a pain-compliant chemical, um, very popular in the late 60s, early 70s. But you had to succumb to the pain to become compliant. And back then... The drugs of choice because we had Woodstock, we had the Vietnam War going on. People were doing PCP, blue shrimp mushrooms, um, LSD, all the psychedelic drugs. So cops were spraying guys, and they're like, is that how you get to? Bring it on. I'm going to kick your butt. <laughs> now, that's not what they said, but I'll keep it PG for your show. Yeah. I read those reports in 1998 when I went to chemical munitions instructor school. In 1975, the FBI adopted pepper, oil as a capsicum, pepper spray. It's a food-grade product. It's the same peppers you and I cook with. It's delivered by a non flammable agent. And when you spray in someone's face for one second, does three things. I know because I personally have been sprayed 31 times. And I've sprayed 425 people to date. I do not spray my civilian students. So if you're thinking about taking a class with me, don't worry, I'm not going to spray you. <laughs> um, in different training scenarios and at the academy where I, I help teach sometimes. When you spring them in the face, it causes an involuntary contraction in the muscle of my eye. I cannot see you to hurt you. Right. I have to close my eyes then, right? Well, you will, you will do it anyways because it causes an involuntary contraction. Mm. Yeah. You will, even with your glasses, I will spray you in the nose, eyebrows, mouth. It will drip down. You'll blink. Done. But your brain takes a snapshot of where you are. That's why in the civilian class, I teach a half-circle move. So if I sprayed you here... You would run at me here, but I would circle around there. You wouldn't even know that. Okay. The second thing it does, constricts the mucous membranes in your nose and throat, making it very difficult to breathe. Mm -hmm. Now, we take breathing for granted, which you're not. Pretty important, yeah. That can create a psychological effect of fear, panic, disorientation, or even better yet, a physiological effect of hyperventilation, where they hyperventilate themselves, they pass out. Perfect. Someone passes out, two things go on. No longer a threat, and they breathe normal. The mm -hmm. third thing, it's a school where here's how much pain you feel. Industry standard is $2 million. To put it in perspective for everyone, if you take a jalapeno pepper, open your eye and stick it in your eyeball, that's 5000 So we're talking $2 million school with heat units. And it's protection at distance, which I love. I'm not about hand-to-hand -hand getting up close. Mm -hmm. The small one shoots 12 feet. The next size up shoots 18. And then we go to the home defense which shoots 25. Regulated by the American trade spice industry, and here's the best thing about this. If you spray the wrong person, which most people won't anyways, but if it happens, everyone's good in 60 minutes. You get a do-over, which you don't get with a gun. So it takes about uh, a recovery time of 60 minutes? Is that what You will be okay in 60 minutes. It depends on the person. Yeah. It lasts anywhere from it's 20 to 45 minutes. I'm the 45-minute guy. If you don't give me water, help decontaminate, I'm a mess for an hour. Mm -hmm. But you get a do-over, and it works on people who are under the influence, people who have a high pain tolerance, works on dogs, works on coyotes. It's a food-grade product. It's the same pepper you cook with. This isn't even new. In the 1600s, the Japanese warriors took satchels of pepper in the battle, and when they ran the battlefield, they would smash it in the adversary's face because they knew back then, the 1600s, it would cause an involuntary contraction in the muscle in the eye, and then they would win the battle that way. So in your training programs, I, I, right away I think there's a skill to this. This isn't something I just picked this up and I'm really good at it. So when we do the training, <laughs> yeah, we do. I do a PowerPoint, we have questions, and then we clear the floor, and then put the safety glasses on, and have everyone ha carry one of these, mm -hmm. and we do drift and drills where you spray me in the face. Because everyone thinks, oh, I need this huge fogger and this. You don't. Nobody misses with this. You always, the, my face is always wet. I mean, I would even let you do it today if you want. I could put my glasses on. You would see, you just lift the safety cap up, spray it, one second, move out of the way. Yeah. So you, 
Aim is not a problem. Yeah. You want me to try it? Yeah, if you want to try it. I mean, do you want to? St can we stand up with the headphones or? I, yeah, whatever. I think we can. Sure. All right. We, we they probably won't hear us. Yeah, try it, and then I'll. Uh, so, see. how this works? Mm -hmm. Just lift there and just push the button down. Okay, that's yeah. all right. Let me just take a look at this. So you want? Are you right-handed? Uh, I'm left-handed. So put it in your left hand. Okay. Okay. So just relax. Yeah, just put it in your left hand. So if I was, and I don't want to pull this off. So if I was a bad guy, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, and you know, if it feels wrong, is wrong. You go with that. So all of a sudden, I'm like, hey, if there's a problem, give me your wallet. You would just point it at my face and spray me for one second. So go ahead, point it up and just aim for my glasses and push. Okay. Okay. That's, so notice, and that's how the other ones work. Yes. Okay, so I can catch up with it. All right. So notice how you hit over here and you came down. Yeah. Pepper, it's colored, so you'll see that. That's fine. My glasses, it went in my mouth. At which point, my eye's going to contract. I'm going to remember you there, so if we were, didn't have these on, you would move over there. Okay, I'd, I'd move I out would, of your way. So you... Yes, and I would have you look for the second person, because we always look for the second person. No second person, you pick up your cell phone, 911. Location, location, location. Because remember, when you dial 911 on a cell phone, um, it goes to the nearest state police barracks. So you just want to tell them, hey, I'm at Beverly, Be you know, Beverly Bevcam. I had a problem. I, I sprayed someone. But you do it when it's safe. You always <clears throat> leave the safety first. Look for the second person that has 25 shots in it. So you, in theory, could take out 25 people. Hopefully, you're not fighting 25 mm -hmm. people. Uh, pretty good, yeah. Yeah. Tell the police where you are and get to safety. Doesn't matter if I'm on drugs. Now, when when I I've done this, if I did that with real pepper spray, what what would you be doing? What would uh, you, a pepper sprayed person, be doing? I, I would be probably either on the ground, on my knees, or most people do this, and they just start shaking their head, and just waiting for it to wear off. Mm -hmm. um, there have been instances where people panic and they just run away blindly. Um, I have plenty of video of that happening in my class where people run into the walls, they have yeah. surveillance cameras. But as a rule, people just stop. They may run around for a minute. But what it's point is they don't want to be involved with you anymore. And you didn't have to touch me. So, like I, like I think if uh, it wouldn't be a good idea to spray you, now I've got you kind of in, in a very vulnerable position and now really jump on you and try to beat. So that's where the liability comes in. Okay. Remember, when the threat stops, the use of force has to stop, right? Okay. Whether it's guns, whether it's pepper spray, that's the law. So you've already incapacitated me. The only way you get in trouble at this point is if you come and start engaging okay. me physically, which hopefully you wouldn't do. All right. I mean, so that's, that's not a good idea because, just because of the liability factor. Yeah, and it's not needed. Yeah. And you, and you want to just get away. You want to get to so safety. That, that stuff is, that pepper spray is pretty powerful, and it's, it's going to do the job. I, there are, I have never seen it not work, and yeah. people... I've heard have, people say that, ah, it doesn't be, Well, here's the thing. It freezes in the wintertime, so if it freezes, it's not going to be effective. Oh, okay. Pepper doesn't freeze, but the carrying agent does. Yeah. You missed... The first shot, but you, as you saw, you can hold it down, just spray across, spray it, right. and that's fine. Because it's hard, and we had no practice. We did this on the fly. Water is harder to see than the pepper, which will come out in an orange or red color. Mm -hmm. So you'll actually be able to see that come out. Well, you know what I'm going to do? Why don't we, because um, there's a couple of more things I want to ask you about it, and okay. we're getting down to time. So uh, we're just going to take a quick break, and we'll come back, and we'll go on to the next uh, issue. Okay? Let me say one quick thing. Pepper spray is legal every place except federal building, courthouse, and on an airplane. Oh, okay. So everywhere else you, you think of, you can bring it. All right. All right. And we're just going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to go into a, a different subject. Uh, not only does Mike do uh, pepper spray and guns, but he also does a lot of um, uh, life-saving life -saving training. And, uh, for example, people in restaurants that choke, Drowning. Yep. What are some of the other areas you cover? So I also do pediatric, child, adult, first aid, CPR, AED training. Um, AED is? Automatic defibrillator. Oh, okay. So if someone's hot, stops. Oh, all right, yeah. You know, you're doing chest compressions, you bring it 
um, you bring it in and hopefully it will restart the house. Put it in regular rhythm. Do you know if like most buildings like this have one on site? <clears throat> I think every building, every uh, public building has one. Yeah, they're supposed and to. And I believe <clears throat> restaurants over, f don't quote me on this, 40 people uh -huh. have to have it. I know I do a lot of choke training in restaurants um, as far as people choking. Yeah. Which I also incorporate. I tell them if we need to choke, let's do some CPR training as well. Um, okay. One thing about choking is, you know, when you do the abdominal thrust, and now it's so funny, I've been doing it so long. We used to do back blows and then right. abdominal thrust, mm -hmm. and then they did away with the back blows, and now the back blows are back. <laughs> so now we're back to five back blows when you put someone over. Loosen it up and then five abdominal thrust. The important thing is with all this, we need to gain consent um, uh, if they're conscious, <clears throat> especially if you're dealing with someone's child. So, unless the child is alone and away and injured, it's implied that the parent would want us to help. Okay. But you can't just, people are trained, I know I want to help people, and then that mindset, let's just charge in there and get it done. But you need consent first before you start helping someone. Um, all right. With, with choking, I've never heard of it being pushed off. I will tell you this. If, for whatever reason, it was going badly and you couldn't help them or they were sh you're not sure, if they're truly choking, the airway is blocked, they're going to pass out, at which point an unconscious person, consent is implied. Not okay. that we want to see that poor person pass out. But, I mean, you know, things happen fast. Things, you know, adrenaline's pumping. A lot of things going on. 911, people calling 911. If they start turning blue, they start, you know, waving their hands around. Um, just like lifeguards have to learn how to not be drowned by the person they're saving because pe people sure. are drowning panic and they tend to pull them down. Yeah. And the same thing with someone who's choking. They can get, start swinging their arms, not intending to hurt us, but mm -hmm. it could, you know, be kind of difficult at times. So okay. you always want to gain consent on that. Um, so, so consent is like, <clears throat> and I, I saw this situation too. Uh, an older woman was choking, and she kept saying, leave me alone, leave me alone. And the thing was, she afterwards, when she was taken care of, she said she was embarrassed, <laughs> and she didn't want anybody coming up and, you know, being embarrassed that she was choking. And, you know, I mean, that's something that, how, do, how does a trained person deal with that? If she said, leave me alone, we would leave her alone. We would all, you would always call 911, get EMS started. Yeah. Because you know the situation is not going to correct itself. Now, did someone just ignore that and help her? Like I wasn't there. Did, did they just say, no, we're going to help you anyways? Uh, it, was kind of, it was a complicated thing. And the, um, the woman said that, you know, she, she didn't want, she was, it was embarrassment. More than, okay. And she knew she couldn't breathe. And I think I think it finally got to the point where somebody in the family just kind of said, "Yeah, go ahead." So that that is a form of, uh, I guess, agreement. Is that would that be? A... <clears throat> does it, honestly doesn't sound like it's a form of agreement. Yeah. But she was okay. I don't think she's <clears throat> filing a lawsuit till all was well yeah, in the no, end. Yeah. But as an instructor, I have to tell my students, "Listen, you need consent before you help." Okay. Just like we <clears throat> we do not teach administering medicine. If you're having a heart attack or you're in distress and you have nitro we can open the bottle we can put it in your hand but we cannot administer you if you are able to take it we can actually assist them with their hand up to their mouth but that's the point where they have to actually put it in okay we never <clears throat> you can't administer you couldn't actually pop it in there no <clears throat> no that's not <clears throat> at the basic first aid you know red cross level even basic basic life support we don't administer that's more advanced life support than um so as you do first aid training, what do you think are the, the most important factors now in a, in a modern society? Is it people being overcome by drugs? Is it, is it drowning in the summer? And what, uh, accidents? I mean, that's got to be a... Well, accidents, of course, and now, you have to, now we get back to check the scene before you help. Because if you go into an unsafe scene without okay. any proper sa safety gear... Now we have another victim to worry about, which is now me, because I chose, chose to go into a situation that was dangerous or unsafe, and I did not have the proper equipment. Um, you mentioned drowning. Summertime's coming. Drowning's a concern. 
I will tell you that <clears throat> everyone should at least be trained with a one-way valve um, because in a drowning victim, the first thing you do is you give rescue breaths to try to get the water out of the lungs. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you the way the water gets out of the lungs, they will regurgitate that and you want a barrier between. Okay, so you, <clears throat> the only thing you're doing is, is blowing, <clears throat> blowing air in and it can't get back into that. That well, one that's the out. first thing before we start doing CPR. Yeah. On the drowning, so if someone goes into cardiac arrest, we start with chest compressions. Then we do rescue breaths. If someone's drowning, we start with rescue breaths, and then we go into chest compressions. So you have to be aware of that, and you always want a barrier in a drowning situation. I mean, you want a barrier anyways. Um, of course, if I... You know, our parents or our kids, barriers don't matter. We're just going to go do what we're going to do. But if you're walking down, you know, Cabot Street in Beverly and someone goes down, if you choose to do rescue breasts, you absolutely want a barrier. Now, if you don't want to do rescue breasts, that's fine. It's proven that there's not oxygen in the blood. As long as you keep the circulation going through the body until EMS arrives, then you will help that person. So there's enough getting to the brain. Yes. <clears throat> the thing to remember is for every minute you wait, to administer care, the chance of survival decreases by 10% per minute. Okay. So, so somebody has 10 or 15 minutes, they're getting into well, the, the shady side, right? Well, 10 minutes, they wouldn't, they wouldn't survive, most likely, uh -huh. if you just wait 10 minutes. Fortunately, in this area, with cell phones and the amount of trained people, you start chest compressions, EMS will probably be there within a few minutes. Now, it's going to be a long few minutes. I get that. Yeah. But also, when the police arrive, they have bags in their car. They have valves. So they would take over. Because the minute the next level of training comes in, that's when you bow out. Okay. You know, I tell my students, listen, I know you're into it, but <laughs> EMS arrives. You know, EMS arrives. No, I got this. We're good. No, nope. what you want to do is you want to tell them, if you can remember, how long you've been doing this and how many cycles of CPI you've done. And then back off and let them take over. There seems to be a, uh, something I, I remember from, uh, and this is a while back. I think I took a class in CPR. And, and am I remembering right that once you start CPR, you can't stop? <clears throat> you as the person doing well, this. Well, if, if you're one person, <clears throat> if you're the only person, then you would stop to do two rescue breaths. So it's a, they changed it to 30 reps across the board, 30 chest compressions, two rescue breaths. And then go back. And then go back to chest <clears throat> compressions. And you continue on until the person comes to, mm -hmm. starts or breathing or on his own, yeah. or someone relieves you, or the scene becomes unsafe. Because okay. especially, you know, I know you mentioned car accidents. Well, what do we have in cars? We have gasoline. So you want to make sure that there's no gasoline leaking out, which could cause a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so you always want to check the scene. Go as long as you can. Now we all have cell phones, so just throw it on speaker, 911, let them know what's going on. They'll ask you, do you know CPR? If they say no, well, are you willing to do chest compressions? They'll talk you through it. Okay. Um, the people in the uh, call centers are really well trained. So, it, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> it seems then <clears throat> that everybody should have that training. And is how what percentage of uh, the population is trained to do CPR and chest compressions and things like that. That I don't know. Yeah. I would, if I had to guess, I would guess it's less than 50%. Yeah, and uh, 50 would be a lot, wouldn't it? It would be. So yeah. I, I just don't know. That's a good, that's something, that's a good stat to look up. Okay. I'm all about stats. Yeah, because I, um, I mean, you just wonder about it. It's so important <clears throat> as part of a uh, thing that we all, <clears throat> I mean, I'm guilty of that too. Why would I want to waste my time doing uh CPR, you know, but when you really think it through, somebody that's close to you could be having that problem, and you're going, I, I know I'm supposed to do something. I just don't know what it is. I don't fault people for not wanting help. I get that. You know, people worry about liability. We have the Good Samaritan Law. As long as you act within your scope of your training, you'll be okay, and you have consent. But this is the way I look at it. If it was someone I knew, my family member, my parent, and I wasn't there, I would hope this person would help them. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, to, I'm going to help this person because someone in their family is hoping someone does something for their family member. How difficult is it to get training? I mean, that's to uh, be trained in that. What it's is it's a five hour, about a five hour class, one day. Yeah. Um, 
you know, depending on what I'm doing, most people like yourself would go through the Red Cross training. Mm -hmm. um, I have the mannequins, uh, child, uh, infant, and adult, where you'll do the compressions, you do the mouth to mouth, we have barriers. I also have training AEDs, the uh, external defibrillators that will go on, it will talk you through it. The good thing is, those talk you through everything, remove clothing, attach the pads, the pads have pictures on them. I just saw a new unit now where instead of two pads, it's one big pad, it just goes on the chest, so you can't do it wrong. Well, it's, the pad is what? Is that some kind of like a <clears throat> buffer for a... No, it sends electric, electrical charge through the body. Oh, okay. And that's why you don't want to be touching it. We teach clear, shock advised, hit the shock button. One thing to remember when you do that, and I go through this training, when the person's unconscious, if you shock them, they're going to have a reflex motion where the head will oh, move off, off the... Yeah. So if you have a blanket, a jacket, whatever to put under it, that's fine. But we don't wait to, for that to happen. I mean, we have to get the heart going again, back in rhythm. Well, I mean, I, I think it seems to me, you know, when we talk about it, that uh, everybody who is able should be trained. Because I think of people now as they get older. So in my group, you know, a lot of people fall. They have falls and mm -hmm. they... Uh, and just because they try to get up or somebody tried to help them up, I saw that happen, you know, and I said, no, no, leave them there. Hold on, you know, let's get somebody here. But <clears throat> I think that type of training, you do any, like, fall training, uh, you know, concussion? Well, that's, that's in the first aid training. It is? the Red Cross, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, obviously, if you hear a thump or a noise and you go in, you see the guy down, but you see, like, a stepladder. Yeah, okay? you figure. We're, yeah. we're not going to move him. We're going to make sure he's breathing, but we're concerned with back, neck injury, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to just coming in and seeing someone, they're in pain, they're down, but they're um, breathing. Then we can put in what's called the rescue position, roll them on their side, support them with your body, address any injuries, call 911, get EMS going, and just make sure they're safe and whatever it could be. It could be from an electrical shock, it could be from a fall. It could be someone tripped over or some, you know, something. In the, we've all tripped over a chair leg. Or a, hey, Mike, you know what I think we could do? <clears throat> you got to bring in some stuff, some of your equipment, and do a. Can you do a class? Is that something? Yeah, no, I, I can do a demonstration with the, uh, with the mannequin, the let, AEDs, let, and let's I, do that because, right. because I think uh, I think we could go on forever. But I think we, we're going to get a. But anyhow, I think we're going to cut it here, and okay. I really I want to say thank you for uh, coming in. Thanks for having me. This and, is fine. I appreciate it. And I'm telling you, I, maybe you, I think you might know it. You, you are a person with a lot of information. It's because I'm you, old. You're a collector. Yeah, but I think I think you've <laughs> done it on, on 26 years. So. You, yeah, and I think people like that are really valuable to the community. No, thank you. And I think that's why I'm going to suggest to Bevcam that you know you you do a show here. And because uh, I, I think we'd all benefit from it, that's for sure. That would so, be interesting. I would, yeah. <laughs> I'll talk to you guys about that. It's something I didn't think okay. about, but sure. All right. Well, anyhow, I want to I want to thank uh, Michael for coming today, and I want to thank uh, Bevcam for uh, doing all the good uh, stuff they do to keep this thing going. And uh, I want to. This is Richard Mullen, and I'm your host today for the Healthy Home. Thank you. Oh, oh, oh.